Yeah, reading the uh, sheet about seeds. In this case, there's one section which is really about the overview of ethics, and that's what I was saying about uh, we're missing out if we don't complete that cycle. So that's part of harvesting and, and cropping. And I didn't mention about genetically modified organisms and that kind of side of things. But yeah, that is a big ethical driver in terms of <coughs> monopolisation of genetics, which is going on for the last 20 years. And they keep on promising the earth and delivering pretty much nothing in practical terms except more profits to centralised global corporations. So anybody who's not part of the global co corporation or whatever, you may as well get into backyard say, seed saving. Um, and yeah, one or two little points about the botany. Uh, but yeah, I mentioned the peppers in the last slideshow. They were changing each generation. But yeah, that's just getting an idea about genetics in terms of we know there are genes and genotypes, but there are also, we, we need to understand that each plant is one expression, uh, a phenotype. And the real explanation of genes is that they've, they're the capacity, capacity to do thousands of different things in response to different environments. So, like we've been discussing the polytunnel and greenhouse stuff, and if you grow outside, it won't grow quite so well. <coughs> but, um, yeah, uh, just thinking about... Uh, yeah, the, the variations that we, we get as backyard seed savers might really suit us and we might get the, the phenotype that we want and select seed from that, which is actually going to be more suitable for us. And I also slagged off the commercial seed, save, seed suppliers who are looking to just grow seeds which have perfect growing conditions or are grown in a lab, basically. And Unless anyone's growing in a test tube and got a big laboratory where they grow their food, forget about that, that version of purity. It is back to kind of like racialist thoughts. It's, I only want white seed. It's the, the uber race of seed, it really is. Sorry, <coughs> it goes to that level though. So yeah, accepting that genetics is really about phenotypes and diversity and then you're adaptable to lots of different changes in the environment instead of having uh, ignoring the environment basically and going for absolute maximum production which is what the commercial guys are on about and that's the only seed they're going to select and the only seed they're going to supply that's a little summary of one page of that. <laughs> and on the other side yeah I could almost say it's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's let's summarise that bit and say it's almost like a Teletubbies version of the world, where they're only allowed to be you know, fluffy ones. Sorry, like that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, uh, on the other side, these are the practical points that for us as growers we're more interested in. And part of that is about space allocation. So when you leave something in the ground, instead of cropping it and finishing with it, it's going to take up space. And again, that's part of your conception of s cycling and how much space and whether you're going to do something. But often I'll grow a bigger crop one year and select out one or a few plants that I want to keep, the ones I like. Uh, and then I'm not yeah, leaving the whole bed. I'm just using a small part of that bed. But also moving plants from place to place. And in some cases that's necessary to avoid wind-blown pollination or insect, blown, insect pollination, which might cross-pollinate. And certain plants, like brassicas, there's lots in the family, and I don't want uh, a sprout, sprouty flower. I want a sprout or a cauliflower. So some things I do have to keep separate and pay more attention to. But a lot of the time it's as easy as just letting peas go to flower. Uh, they won't cross-pollinate. And things like tomatoes and peppers you can grow lots of different types of tomato next door to each other, and the seed from each different plant will stay true to its parent and not get cross-pollinated. They're called simple flowers. 
And that's where the same male and female on the same flower, of the same plant, are pollinating. And that's, that's all that needs to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, again, getting a sense of those crop fam families and that some of them are simple flowered, like the uh, tomatoes. <coughs> Others are more promiscuous. And, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. There is stuff to say about, yeah, uh, uh, yeah storing, storing seed later on, but I'll carry that in pictures. Yeah, first picture here, this is actually a yew tree. And I noticed this in Western Park a couple of years in January. And nothing else was really happening. That's how many pollen grains were coming off this, pot, this yew tree. So it was a nice sunny day in January. And there's probably billions of pollen grains emerging. And each one of those is a germ that, if it finds the right female, could produce a whole new yew tree. So the contrast in terms of their microscopic grains. And each yew tree is a humongous thing that can grow for thousands of years. So that, that's the... Uh, the, the potential, the strength of genes. And here's the lovely crop of Hungarian grazing rye growing next door to the polytunnel with the comfrey plants on the right. And you can just see a very light haze of purple on the grazing rye. And that's the indication that that's doing the same thing. It's releasing pollen and it's wind blown, so it has to blow from plant to plant. And that means that just from this crop, uh, there's quite a lot, you can see, of phanotypes here. So some of them are taller and some of them are squatter. Over the years, with grains, the farmers uh, bred and selected shorter and shorter, gra shorter and shorter plants so that they were easier to combine <coughs> harvest. Now, I'm not sure whether I want tall ones or short ones, so I've kept them all. And so within that gene bank, I've got an enormous spread of ge different genetic possibility. I could select out the tallest and get them taller and taller, or short, smaller and smaller, but mid-sized and those, those extremes is what I'm in, more interested in. That's, uh, that's when it's actually produced a crop, and yeah, rye would have been an easier crop to grow for farmers in the long-term past than wheat or sweet corn or the crops they grow now. Makes a good bread, and yeah, it's got multi-purpose, so it can be food in this stage, or it can be just as a green manure and a soil improver. Uh, allowing it to get to, now it's at the stage where the stalks are just slightly green still, but the heads are mostly dried, but they're not 100% dried. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually just not chop them off mm. so I can start to clear that ground for the next crop. And I'll save these, keep them dry, put them in stooks, and the last bit of energy from the stalk of the plant that's still green will still get them up into the head and finish off ripening them. Like those physaluses, they're still, they're still ripening. And the tomato, that's been off the plant for a month or more. Uh, so yeah, uh, making use of space, moving the crop on. And also, that means I'm getting the crop in before vermin, like rats and mice, find it. And I have had mice, they crawl up these stems. They, that, that means the weight of the mouse bends the stem down to the ground, and then they can nip off the head, and then they can drag the head off. And they store it, and sometimes I find it. Uh, a cache of heads, just the heads. And they, they're thinking the same way as me. They're getting them just before they're fully right, before I've got them, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that would have been the uh, story of farming throughout the ages. And, yeah, the, the pictures recently of Australia, where they've got, it's, it's more than a plague of mice, it's a, an ocean of mice in some of the farms. And just like the video of billions of mice, and then billions more. And billions more because they've got all these prairies and they've got all this grain and then they've got billions of mice. And yeah, the potential losses to agriculture again, if we get above 50%, we're doing well. And yeah, wind blown pollination. Uh, this is the sweet corn again, the point at which they've pollinated. The lighter ones not quite been pollinated yet. And here's another genetic uh, <coughs> expression this is the ink and rainbow sweet corn. And the point of this picture is uh, I was. I bought seed and maybe saved them for a year or two and then decided that it was worth arranging them in this pattern where some of the heads were almost entirely red or purple on the left. Then you can see almost like a digital display around on the right to where they're white or yellow. And some of the whiter ones are actually more 
what we'd use as a maize uh, rather than a sweet corn, as a, a hard sweet corn. And yeah, they've actually got visibly five or six, half a dozen different types of sweet corn combined in them. And this is actually from Mexico. It is a land race. What a land race is, is if we kept on growing these year after year, they'd carry on being roughly like this with this spectrum. Again, a wide spectrum of genetic traits. And what sweet corn, uh, in order to get the standard sweet corn, they only grew the yellow ones, and then they bred them against themselves. And it was quite by chance that all modern sweet corn derives from one particular lady who chose out a particular strain, and now that's all they, they, all they grow. So it's like in genetic terms, it's getting that as thin as possible, and that's used as a base for a whole industry. But it's a tiny little section of everything that's possible within the genetic range possible. And yeah, with sweet corn, you do have to grow lots of plants, the more the better, to retain this mixture of, of genes. But yeah, ink and rainbow, sweet corn being a kind of like uh, cover girl for genetic kind of campaigning. Because uh, yeah, it's il perfectly illustrating the, the need to retain all those genetic components. And there's this variety, ink and rainbow, it's going to have more resilience and more robustness and more likelihood to carry on year after year after year without failing. Uh, this one it really does prefer growing in Mexico, but it can be grown in decent soil in, in our season. So, uh, yeah, that's the Incomando sweet corn. Uh, here's also wind, wind pollinated beetroot. So, this is just thinking in, term, in terms of space. I want, I've got four types of beetroot. The one on the far left is the uh, bull's blood, and that was originally grown more like a spinach, just for the leaf. But again, that's where our purple beetroots have now been evolved from, and the summer beetroots that we buy in shops, they tend to be all that one type. But these other ones with green leaves, with red stems and green leaf, uh, these are more winter, deep-rooted, turnip-rooted, like a parsnip beetroots. And they're great because they'll last in a hard winter, or if you live in the middle of a continent, you can have beetroot all the way through the winter. And that's the idea about uh, European culture, beetroot soup, borscht, being really popular in certain places. Because they could still lift beetroots in the coldest winter, and when everything else had run out, whole cultures survived just on beetroot. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the point here is those four different lines, they're four different types. If I let them all go to flower together, they'll get wind pollinated and I'll get a mixture in the next generation. And I won't keep the traits of those particular lines. But I can lift one or lift, select a few that I think are the good ones and replant them again. And again, by planting inside a polytunnel, when it goes to flower and pollen blows around, uh, as long as that's the only type of beetroot going to flower in that polytunnel at that time, I'll be able to save that seed and it'll be as pure as I, can, I, I need it. And this type is Bluta, which my friend Diane, who works on the Leaf Project, gave me, because uh, she met Jeff Hamilton once. And he was a great gardener who in the early 90s, or even 80s it might have been, did a comparative uh, grow-out on telly, where he grew everything chemical, which he'd been normally doing, because that's what everyone did, and then he grew everything organic. And after that, he never grew anything chemical before, because he realised that everything tasted so much better organically and it was protecting itself and all the predator relationships came in. So that was his kind of like token plant where just a reminder of uh, him going completely organic before he died about 10 years later. Um, yeah, so that's the plant just building a stem. So again, that's stage three or four in the plant eight stages of plant development just before it starts to form flowers which are giving off pollen and you can actually see some of the pollen on the leaves. And then this next picture, the bits that are in focus at the front and the top, they're the little fruitlets of beetroots. And they don't have just seeds. They have, like those walnuts, uh, they're, f they're fruit around, <coughs> seeds inside, and you get several seeds in each clus cluster. Uh, so when you sit, sow one of these beetroot seeds, you might get half a dozen, up to half a dozen seedlings from each little fruitlet. But what they've done in industry, again, is they've selected so that every fruitlet just has one seed. So it conforms to the, uh, 
or whatever, centralised monopoly, you know, whatever, dictator. Uh, but yeah, uh, to get independent of, on, on these things is great. These are Oxheart Garand carrots, which are one of the nice, well, there's some really nice ones, but one of the nicest of a growing. These were the typical market carrot around Paris, 19th century, and they were working on thin, shallow, but heavy clay soils. So they were hard to work up for carrots, but because they've got broad shoulders and they don't need to go very deep, they form very close to the surface. They worked on those particular soils. And to be able to keep these going, here's, uh, again, different varieties growing with the fleece cover, and then selecting and checking again to making sure they are not got pests or diseases or little mites on them. And putting, yeah, selecting out uh, these are different types, ready for planting out for seed and planting out individual specimens inside each of several different polytunnels and greenhouses in order to collect seed that's relatively true to type. And with carrots, remembering they're an umbelifer, so they need collecting every year because in two or three years they lose viability. So with carrots it's a bit of a bind. Every year or two you've got to grow them out and the next year save them for seed on a kind of ongoing basis if you want to keep those going. And I've still got some of these going. These are actually Nant carrots in this particular slide. Uh, earthing them up and soil sculpturing around them so that it's easy to water them and letting them go to flower. And again, that's at stage three. Off they go up to towards flowering. They've not started flowering quite yet. Building the flower heads inside a polytunnel. And there's the flowers just starting to open out. And this particular flower, that's the John's purple carrot. Because if you can see, there's one particular flower in the very middle, it's purple. Mm -hmm. And again, it's amazing genetic characteristics, but uh, maybe the bees, I don't know if they can see that. But yeah, that's the indicator that that's going to come out as that purple fleshed, yellow middled, true Afghan John's purple carrot, different from purple haze. And yeah, that one little trait gives it away. These flowers are just opening out, just being pollinated. These are often fly pollinated, <coughs> and that includes hoverflies. And that means that I'm getting hoverfly attractant inside my polytunnel. And as long as I've got a window open somewhere, uh, I'll get hoverflies coming in from the wild, and then they'll reproduce and they'll carry on feeding uh, on aphids and they'll keep my aphid population down. So they're pollinating the carrots, and they're keeping the aphids away at the same time. And in this case, some of these carrot heads are just reflexed outwards. They've just opened out. Some of them are reflexed inwards. That means the seed is already set. And they want to hold the seed until it's fully formed, until it's ripe, maybe at the end of the season, until the storm comes along and smashes it apart, and then the seeds will be distributed. So they don't germinate and are spread roughly at the right time. Plants are doing a lot, you know, a lot of work or thinking on their own terms, keeping themselves going. Now here's another case. This is a heritage cauliflower, and this is St George cauliflower. And it's bred so that it does this on St George's Day, which is roughly the 23rd, 24th of April. And that means it's got to live through the winter. Uh, so first it's got to grow up and yeah, if we let all the whole cauliflower go to flower, this is one example where it, it wouldn't actually successfully on its own set many seed. It's dependent on human intervention. So in order to get such ridiculous genetic freak of a cauliflower bud, and that one was about a 15 pounder, uh, it's required humans to actually come along and actually cut most of the flowers off. Because otherwise that, that, that plant, big as it is, with a big root system, just hasn't got the energy to set like 50,000 seeds all, all in, one, all in one, one go. So that's uh, an extra process we have to, if we're going to get seed. So we, we, we could actually still eat some of this, so it's still edible food, but taking off maybe 90% of those florets in order that just a few are left and then the plant isn't overburdened and it can actually set seed. That's an open pollinated kale and that's behaving differently. So that hasn't had all this messing about and dependency on humans. It's not so extreme in its genetic characteristics and that can actually just be left 
open pollinated and it'll set the right amount of seed on the plant that it could actually survive in the wild for a few years or as a land race again. <coughs> and there's some kale seeds or mustard seeds uh, distributing themselves and <coughs> gradually <coughs> setting along. And like those pod radishes, they look a bit like the pod radishes. Uh, that's when the pod radishes can be eaten. And just having a look at the mustard seed on the right, has that? Is it ready to fall out of plants yet? Do I need to collect it? And checking while it's still green, it can be left out. But if the weather's going to be really dry, and I might try and gather it or stop it falling off the plant. If there's, if there's going to be a dry period, if it's going to carry on being cold and wet or damp, then I might not need to, to collect it for a bit longer. And slightly re related to that, a bit more ornamental, there's woad. And that has, so it's also a brassica. In this case, it's got dingly dangly uh, seed pods. Form, it's got normal yellow brassica flowers. And the leaves can be eaten like brassicas. It's a bit, bit rougher than a cabbage. But yeah, that's a woad. And here is the pod radish. And that's related, raffanus related to brassica. And they can be eaten. Good tip because, yeah, it's quite hard to grow a good crop of radishes because they all go to flower. And in this case, you want them to go to flower so that they start to set seed. Uh, if you leave them too long, they'd actually have hard seed in them. But you could pickle the radishes. And yeah, and what I've heard is that in there's one variety called Munchen beer, Munich beer. Mm. And when they have their beer festivals in, in Germany and drink huge steins of beer, they have these alongside them, and they're quite, kind of like the uh, a precursor to people to make you drink more beer. Well, the um, hoverflies live them as well. Yeah, yeah. And here's a bed of the corn salad that's just going to flower with a blue, light blue flower. But here's another, uh, this is the uh, yellow leek, jaune de Poitiers, and this one's been bred to be extra long. And in this case, we buried the young leek plants as deep as we could possibly get them to give them as long as possible, a shaft as possible. Mm -hmm. And we haven't actually blanched the leaf, that's a very light yellow, a, a light uh, green, almost yellow. But yeah, keeping all these specific varieties going, and that makes the kind of yeah, most fragile, lightest, uh, most piquant kind of leek. It's not the hardy winter type. Uh, I don't think I've got any here actually today. But um, yeah, having the diversity of lots of different types. So there's, I think that is a, 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 the Monstroso de Carantan, a hardier winter leek, darker green. And again, I've eaten the rest of the bed and I've actually selected a few plants that I think are really good. And that's another point with seed saving, that the logic is actually, you eat all the small ones, and if you want them to be decent sized ones in the next generation, you leave the biggest. So, yeah, uh, it's a bit counterintuitive because you tend to eat the biggest first. And I still do that a lot myself. But, yeah, if you can save good specimens, basically, ones that aren't diseased, that are representative of that particular variety, uh, and leave a few of those so that the seed you get then improves. Because otherwise, if you, say like with the peas, if you eat all the first peas, and only save the last few tiny ones on the bush. Mm. After three or four years, all your peas would be late, and maybe the last little ones on the on the bush, that kind of thing. Uh, and yeah, just go through the process of leek seed, setting, uh, breaking open their heads, which is I find very very amusing because mm. they've got these little he helmets on, hats on, and gradually as they get, uh, yeah, as they get in the sun actually, as the sun gets hotter in say about eight, June to July they swell up inside and then eventually uh, you get the seed head or the flower head emerging ready to get pollinated and there's leeks going to flower and then setting seed and yeah those of you who have taken leek seed already there's some more over there each, each point where there's a flower each little ball on that has three pairs of seed in it and if that's one leak, again, that's come from one seed, and now it's got a couple of thousand leak seed on it. So the multiplier effect, or the underlying, underlying profitability of this, <laughs> we should be able to make some. Yeah, well, yeah that, that's, that's the kind of like, yeah, beauty and the sadness of it, that 
Uh, you can get thousands and thousands out of one. And there's the seed just drying out, almost falling out. Leeks takes a long time to dry on the head. It's taken a while. There's beautiful clary sage going to flower. That's more for just the beauty of it. And there's an aubergine seed. And, oh, it's an aubergine flower. And it's a single entire petal that's formed around the ovary. And there's a beautiful white aubergine which has formed mm. in the middle of it. And yeah, tinkering with genes, a lot of these things were achieved you know, hundreds of years ago. And maybe they were white, or they're probably actually, I think, yellow and orange before they were purple. But the white ones don't have the bitterness of the purple one. So I prefer to grow them. They are harder to grow. And there's the pineapple tomato. And that variety, that is bigger than the uh, bananas by the side. And again, just waiting for the red to start to form and being able to kind of like, yeah, show off to yourself and others. <laughs> uh, there's potato flour, that's related to the aubergine, Solanaceae family. Uh, there's a uh, rocket flower with lovely brown veins on the leaves, and the flowers are lovely to eat. So, looking at those. And there's fennel, that's just going to flower. I like to eat the flowers at this stage, and that's, yeah better than sweet or as good as sweets. So you can get kids to eat them uh, if they haven't been eating sweets recently. And then there's Callaloo, which is a, uh, a summer spinach that specialises in hot conditions. It's got a deep tap root. But, uh, that's a good substitute for spinach and it's really hard to grow spinach in the summer unless you've got a shady site. So maybe that's a better bet in some cases than trying to grow true spinach. And here's past it's going to seed and that's another umber umberlifry so it's holding the seeds up. Uh, they're going to fall off quite quickly. All these umbiliferi, if we don't use them up that year or the next year, uh, they won't keep for very long. The germ inside each seed is only very, very tiny. So the chances of it drying out. And yeah, with all the seeds when we're storing them, every month the proposition is that they kind of actually very slightly expanding and very slightly contracting. And that's expl an explanation of uh, viability of seeds. That they want, they'd like to grow, yeah, they want to, they're ready to grow any time. And if you're, yeah, that's why they keep them in uh, kind of uh, vacuum-packed conditions, to try and stop that impulse to grow. But if it's with the moon, maybe they're being tempted every, every four, four, month, four weeks or so. And that's lovage, actually, which is a real brute. That'll grow virtually anywhere. And that's got a slightly bigger version of similar seeds, same family. And then a little sequence here, just with the winter squash, or squash family, cucurbits, and how they get pollinated. Uh, they are, again, promiscuous, liable to cross. And one of my apprentices, Stephen, uh, thought he knew it all, and he grew some winter squash, and he left, let, let some courgettes go to flower nearby, or pumpkins. And then the next year, when he grew them, he came back to me and said, oh, you were, really were right, that they will cross-pollinate, because squash tastes like pumpkins, they're no good. I don't store. So, yeah, if we can, inside the polytunnel, we're going to select a nice male flower, strip off its outer leaves, because we just want the bit in the middle, and then we want to introduce that to a lovely female. And here we are. This is, ooh, sexual reproduction. <laughs> and that's so that the fruit that forms at that point, we should be fairly sure, is true to type, because the male and the female have both come from the same source, same genes. Uh, and that's worth doing if you can be bothered. And again, that's within a polytunnel so we don't get insects randomly cross-pollinating. Uh, and obviously that's not from the seed of that. But yeah, the wonderful range of different winter squash. I think all those are really good types. I haven't got some of the seed of these anymore. Maybe I've got them stored away a long way. Uh, and back to peas. And uh, that's the purple-bodied peas. Uh, and maybe, no, these are actually the commander. These are fatter and purple podded, uh, stubbed at the end, and green inside, of course, but much easier to find on the plant when they're purple. Uh, you can lose green peas quite easily. And there's purple beans, climbing beans, and there's the borlotti beans, which they wouldn't have grown at all this year, even in the polytunnel, because uh, it was that cold. Where they, they really need Italy to grow. Uh, oh, and let's just go back to, there's the range of beams. It's coming back there. 
yeah, this is the range of beans, and just illustrating again, the ones at the back are the dwarf ones. They need a shorter growing season, so they're riper than the ones at the front. The ones at the front are bigger, but they've needed a much longer growing season, especially if we're going to actually collect viable seeds out of the middle of them. So dwarf ones, as a kind of like uh, insurance scheme or as a banker, as that's in the sense of we used to use banks as reliable institutions. Sorry. Uh, they're more reliable, the, one, the one dwarf ones. But yeah, if we've got a normal season, we should be able to grow both. And yeah, seed collecting and storing, uh, I, yeah, I prefer, prefer to store all seed at room temperature in permeable bags, paper bags. And the trays on the left with newspaper, that's what we use first for gradually drying them out and then reducing the amount of chaff, often in several stages. And this is something you learn from paying attention to your plants. Instead of trying to get the seed off and dry in one operation, just like that, one day. Now, first you, like, like we had at the beginning, cut the rye down, leave it for a week or so, then take the heads off, then leave it for a week or so, then rub out the seed, then leave them for a week or so. So all these are incremental processes and help if you can uh, come back and time and time again do stuff. A few sieves to help labelling to remember what's what uh, and I like uh, things like pillowcases to bash them with as well because they're very indestructible seeds and here's a couple of guys picking off, this is one of the windbone seeds, this is uh, salsify uh, lovely flowers but if you don't pick the seeds off they'll get blown away by the parachute so they're wind distributed uh, not wind pollinated but wind distributed and here's lots of peas ready to process Jumping up and down on peas on a towel in that case looks a bit messy, but we'll select out. And always seeds are heavier than their chaff. So once the chaff's dry, they will uh, just fall out, basically. There's a nice picture of Greek cress and the pods drying out separate. So those are smaller, much smaller seed, but similar in terms of basically the pod is like, like the beans and peas pods. So you learn on a big scale and then relate it to the smaller scale stuff. It comes out virtually the same. That can be just blown away or selected or rubbed off. Uh, there's Claire auto winnowing with her, her, her breath, getting rid of the last bits of dust and chaff from some rye grain. There's the rye head. And there's one of the kids bashing a cloth full of rye. And Stephen thrashing. So he's getting a whole stick of a whole load of different bit, uh, bits of rye, thrashing on the ground, but make, making sure we collect as much of the seed as possible. And then, just as a joke, I get people to grind up the, the grain to work out how hard it is to make flour. And it is really hard. That's a mortar and pestle. And it can take half an hour just to make a handful. And there's a seed saving workshop, saving some mustards. And yeah, again, I do like this. Uh, that guy at the back, Gordon. Uh, these are great characters. And you wouldn't believe how restricted and disabled their lives were, but they were perfectly capable of participating in all these things around seed. And maybe that, get, you know, that, that should give this, this whole thing a, a really good reputation. This is at the Shirebrook project that I ran for a few years. This is out at Unston Grange. And by this time, it's end of the year, and rather than give up, it's seed bagging time. And then uh, if we can put enough seeds in bag, little, little envelopes, we can have a seed day. So that was having seed days at Unston, that's about 10 years ago or so. And yeah, distributing, sharing the joy of the seeds. Hopefully some of those seeds are still percolating around and people are still valuing them. And then we're back to you. That's good. So there's the whole works, that's the agriculture course, 2012. Okay. <laughs> And yeah, normally at the end of courses, I, I've been taking this less formally than other courses because there's not as many of you. And I do a feedback and I say, was it all right for you? And over the years, when I was trained up, trained to be a proper uh, teacher like, it was good practice to ask all these different questions and you'd have like a whole form to fill in. And then over the last few years, I got it down to one question. Is it okay? But I don't really even bother to ask. If you're still here at the end, it would be all right. <laughs> and yeah, the point about the course is 
it's got those principles and theories involved, but it builds, and hopefully by the end of the course you see the sense of getting the, the core building block ideas. And then what that opens up. So if you do your soil preparation, and you get your fertilisers, and you put your time in, then all that world of wonderful produce, and saving seed, and all the kind of like joys evolve out of that. Mm -hmm. There's no need to rush off, so if you want to nibble more or have a look for some more seeds, we'll just gradually wind up. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm going to do next year. I'm, I'm thinking about, I'd love to get a huge number of people and do it to a large number of people, but it's uh, getting out together to publicise and maybe starting that in, in March, that's my idea at the moment. But yeah. It's a bit like that. Uh, through the year, if I'm active in the year and have stalls, then I do contact individuals and make kind of connections with people, and that gives me a core group, and then extras on top of that. Uh, this year's was a bit dis I, I relied on the mainstream to do my publicity because it was the Sheffield Food Festival in September and I thought surely amongst all those hundreds of foodies there'll be enough people to come on the course uh, and maybe they're just interested in eating the stuff and not growing the stuff but alongside that there's been more competition in the last few years by people who think they can monopolise the subject and they've got the funding to do it or they've got this project to do it but yeah if you go and see any of the kind of like organised projects if they're still going they're not talking about agriculture they're not talking about individual growers and maybe individual growers can get together and be organised but all they're talking about is kind of exploiting the good the goodwill or the publicity around it and yeah just doing a small course for the number of people we've had a dozen down to half a dozen that's more meaningful to me than you know, launching some multi-million pound funding thing. Because, yeah, Tim's had the same experience. And it's, talking, it's talking to the Wi-Fi now. <laughs> Go away. Yeah, you've had a similar experience with Green Top Circus. Uh, set it, you've watched it for you and your mates. Set it up, kind of, out of the goodwill of your hearts and out of huge, huge amount of dedication. But to legitimise it, at some point, the funding almost squeezes a lot of that, that good energy out and it just becomes a, a form-filling process. And yeah, if anybody knows anybody who can grow food by filling in forms or can do trapeze act by filling in a form, I believe it when I see it. Isn't it? There's practical it's subjects. At a certain point of projects or the people running a project sort of see a benefit in bringing in business expertise, which there probably is a benefit, but normally you only get one or the other, so then you bring in a business person instead of a service person, or instead of a, someone yeah. who knows their horticulture, and mm -hmm. although it grows in some senses and can look really good on paper, it, it's kind of lost something, mm -hmm. hasn't it? But that's the essence I'd, I'd pass on to you, and it's partly the kind of resilience and robustness to keep going and keep trying, but yeah, that one decent grower is much more important, can be much more important than a multi-million pound project. And, you know, like, just talking to your neighbours and, like, in infecting people a little bit here and there mm. might actually have more long-term consequence than something that looks great on paper and, like, it's, looks like it's generated loads of jobs for six months and then whatever. Well, I can't remember. Well, no, I think I, 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 um, I've got a very clear touch the end of the 